delighted, though, in, in, in the time that we have to um, introduce our panelists very briefly and um, have time for some short presentations from them and then a lot, a lot of time for questions and conversation. So uh, as, as usual, people's written bios with all the details about their work are, are in the packet in your folder. So I won't go into great detail, but I'll just say very briefly, Iman Suleiman Panate uh, is the spiritual leader of Masjid al-Aqsa in Harlem and the president of the Council of African Imams. Um, Sahar Aslani, um, can I say your last name? Aslani. Aslani, okay, is a interfaith peace activist, among many other things. Um, and Sarah Saeed, uh, works now for um, City Hall, up in the mayor's office, engaged with local Muslim communities and policy issues around Muslim life in New York. Um, it breaks my heart that the mayor hired her away from the Interfaith Center, where she was my colleague, sitting like three feet from me for five years. So I'm sure Iman Panate and Sahar will uh, not mind if I say that I'm especially delighted to have Sarah with us today. So, we'll see you um, My heart is broken too. <laughs> you know, like working for the city, some pluses and minuses. We can talk about when the video is off. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> and, and just again, very briefly, I, I, I never like to kind of put people into rigid little boxes, but it is important to flag that you know, we try to represent at least a tiny bit of the immense diversity of Muslim life uh, in the city with speakers who are Sunni and Shia uh, and from different um, ethnic national backgrounds from West Africa, Iraq, and, and India in terms of their family roots, um, women and men, clergy and lay leaders, and, and they're all awesome no matter what box you put. So um, uh, I'll, ask them. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll ask them each to speak for like 10, 12 minutes, tell us a little bit about their work and their perspective on Muslim life in New York, and then we'll have as much time as possible just to chat afterwards. And everyone's going to defer to everyone else. <laughs> Okay, uh, good morning everyone. Um, it's very nice to be here and um, yeah, it's, um, government work is definitely different than nonprofit work and I'm really grateful for the experience that I had at the Interfaith Center for about eight years working with diverse grassroots faith communities in New York City um, for Muslims among them. I think it really prepared me government into closer contact with faith communities and also communities in City Hall and in the Community Affairs Unit um, of the Mayor's Office. It's an office that deals with all of New York City communities um, and our task is basically to be the, the bridge between City Hall and New Yorkers. And um, New York City is very diverse. There are a lot of communities with a lot of issues, a lot of on individual issues, and um, that's both the beauty and the you know, challenge of working in a place like New York City. Um, in our unit, we have borough directors who have two borough directors per borough, except for Staten Island, which has one. We also have um, what are called constituent liaisons, individuals who, in addition to the borough directors, have specific responsibility dealing with specific for instance, there's a youth person, person who deals with youth community, youth population, and then young people, and then there is somebody who deals with the LGBTQ universe, there's someone who deals with the animal rights activists, there's someone who deals with um, Jewish communities, there's someone who deals with faith communities, and me, my portfolio is largely focused on Muslim. So because of my background, um, work I did at the Interfaith Center, I do tend to also do other things like trying to move in more of the non-Abrahamic traditions into the work that we're doing um, and thinking about um, issues broadly. 
broadly from a Muslim lens, a lot of things that Muslims are dealing with right now impact other communities like South Asians and Arabs who may not be Muslim, right? So there's different ways to slice the Muslim pie, I guess. Um, so, and within, within what I do, I mean, on a day-to-day -day basis, basically, I am trying to put together programming that is reaching out to Muslim communities and South Asian, Arab, and other faith communities. Um, trying to bring agencies into greater contact with folks so that people understand what resources the city offers them. Um, and I'm thinking, when I say this, it's programming or like the ID NYC card, which is a free ID card, um, really useful for people who are not documented. Um, and programs from the city mission on human rights that help help people report discrimination in housing, um, employment, uh, trying to bring greater like, greater community in the New York Police Department and community so people feel more comfortable, for instance, reporting hate crimes where they just understand what is a hate crime. So it's about creating those kinds of conversations, and then on the other side, I'm also talking with agencies <coughs> to make sure their programs and policies are responsive to most culturally responsive to Muslim communities. Their outreach is culturally responsive. So right now, I mean, just to give you a little more, I guess, deeper example of the kind of stuff I do on a day-to-day -day basis. Right now, we have, we're in the process of planning a whole week next week, which will be an event, which is called City Hall in your borough. The mayor has been going to each uh, borough at the entire administration goes to that borough. That means agency heads are in the boroughs doing events. Um, so next week we will be in Queens, and we're in our, our unit of this task of helping to plan these events. So one of the events that will be happening next week is the town hall with the mayor. The mayor is going to go through town halls in every uh, great city council district around the city. So there will be one in Queens next week, and our unit of the community is going to help staff those town halls, and that can everything from like logistics like checking in people to holding a mic and passing it on to people who are asking questions which is, i just did that two days ago in the bronx um and then also helping literally think about voice to community yeah so literally quite literally communities. and then helping to think about or helping inform the mayor and um you know whoever is agency heads are going to be at that town hall what are the key issues for that council district like what do people care about because our unit again is like the eyes and ears of the administration so we have a good sense of what the major issues are for each council district we're also um, in the process of planning um, a meeting with immigrant um, service providers and advocacy leaders um, to meet with the mayor's office of immigrant affairs the commissioner will be there we're hoping that the borough president and the mayor will stop by at that um, we're also going to be doing on Friday a day of action that tries to respond to the tra uh, travel ban. So we're reaching out to New Yorkers um, at different subway stations on Friday in the morning, just giving out literature, informing them about what this ban is about and what kind of programs the city is offering, and then also be going to mosques on, that, on the same day doing the same thing. So I'm, you know, I'm, we're thinking about how these events look, managing the logistics of that, and figuring out where we're going to go, how we get volunteers to help us. So those are the kinds of things I do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, this is the first time that a mayor has ever had someone in this role working with Muslim communities. So it's um, a wonderful opportunity, but also it's a path that's not been trodden. So it's challenging because, you know, I'm trying to figure out um, things that probably no one else has dealt with before, <laughs> you know? So it's just, it's, um, it can, and I have a great, you know, wonderful, supportive um, you know, group of folks out in the community who really appreciate having someone in this role. So there's, you know, I'm able to turn to people and ask for feedback and input into the kinds of things we're working on. Um, and yet it is also, um, it can get lonely at times, so, <laughs> um, 
but, but that's just the nature of any kind of work I think that we're doing, right? Like there are decisions that we make and um, we're accountable and responsible for them they may or may not be right, but we just have to keep doing the work. Um, <coughs> and, I, and, and I know that I'm at the end of no, no. the no, no, I, I have oh. a question for you. Oh, okay. Um, and I just wanted to say, I have, because you're all teachers, um, I should say that I have been dealing with the Department of Education as well as one of the many agencies we work with. And over the past two years, I've had opportunities to, you know, before I started working for the city, I started in June two years ago. Before that was like April, or I think April, when uh, the mayor signed in um, law, the uh, observance of the Eve holiday as a public school holiday. So two holidays were added to the New York City public school calendar. <coughs> and then when I came uh, on board, one of the questions, or the requests for, from communities that the chancellor had you know, said she would be interested in doing is to create a curriculum to help teachers teach about Eve in the classroom. So we had a chance to work on that. The Department of Education does have a, a teacher handout um, providing guidance on how to teach about E. It's available on the Department of Education website. It's also available on our summer institute website. We have a link to it. Oh, great. Um, and hand in hand with that, we also were able to develop curriculum on, on uh, Diwali and the Lunar New Year. Um, and one of the great things about this process, I think, is important is that this curriculum was developed with community input. So the Department of Education put together a draft of what it wanted to put into the EAD teaching guide. That went out to community groups, community groups for all three holidays, um, and academic experts were included in that, reviewed the content and gave feedback, and then that was redrafted. Um, so it's a great process, right, because you often from, from what I understand, curriculum is not typically created in this way, right? It's usually like academic people who are academic experts, a PhD, not, not against PhDs, I have one too, who seems like sits behind a desk and writes up something, you know, and it's not. And what's great is just that what we're talking about here is just like the intersection of lived experience with academic <coughs> theory and this curriculum, you know, reflects that, which I think is, is amazing. Um, and then I also have worked with the Department of Education on um, increasing their responsiveness to instances of bullying in the you know, school system. It is the moment in which Muslim kids, unfortunately, and Arabs and South Asian uh, children are experiencing more uh, bias in, uh, in the classroom. So we're just trying to do ways to just pay better attention to that. And the Department of Education actually introduced they have what's called a day of respect uh, for all program or a week, where schools are encouraged to do programming that enhances respect in the classroom, in the school settings, through school safety, and um, <coughs> teachers and counselors and administrators are given training about you know respect and diversity. So what the Department of Education did um, for that is they added a training on religious diversity, which is really great. Um, just to help teachers start to think about, you know, what does it mean to have a religiously diverse classroom, um, and that's been rolled out, and teachers and administrators and counselors have participated in that. Um, uh, yeah, so so those are some some of the initiatives. I mean, the school, the Department of Education doesn't require schools to teach Eid. It doesn't require anyone to go through this religious diversity training or respect. Um, but, it, but it's a great, um, you know, it's, it's been, I think, really helpful to just help open people's minds and give them more access to resources like curriculum resources. Um, to so you're all playing a really important role. Um, and um, it would be great to just hear you know, more from you as to your questions and, uh, and also to know about how you take the stuff that you've gotten here in the institute and how that look, what that looks like when you actually implement it as a classroom. I'd love to hear from Sarah, we hope you were actually not at, quite out of time yet. Oh. And I wanted to ask you one other question. Um, I wonder if I could um, 
<laughs> because we worked in the same office for five years, I'll just feel free to, to bug you. Um, uh, I wonder if you, if, it's, if you're willing to speak a little more personally about you know, what motivates and inspires you in the work you're doing now. I know you have a, a very, very hard job sometimes, and I know you are you know, deeply committed to it as a New Yorker um, and to your sense of responsibility and, and love for this whole city, but also like as a Muslim. You know, what is there in, 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 in your faith and in your understanding of um, Islamic ethics and teachings that you know, makes the work you're doing in City Hall now important to you? Not to put you on the spot. Right? No, I mean, it's, it's, it's a wonderful question. I just try to be specific, I guess, in my reply. I think, I think, you know, for all of us, um, I think having a sense of community is very important wherever we are, right? Um, we live in community, um, and problems impact. Um, and the way for us in the future and in the world is to pay attention to collective and community and to think about how we move forward in the world and solve problems together. Um, within that big picture, I mean, like I, I came to the United States when I was eight years old, and being a Muslim in New York City, um, I grew up in the Bronx, you know, that was not a borough in which was my neighborhood anyway, there weren't that many Muslims. So I always had the sense of myself as somebody who was like a bridge builder. On one level, it's about explaining who I am, what my community is, what my faith is about, just having to do that really for all of my life. And anyone, I'm sure that that experience is shared by many people and many communities. Um, so that, I think, was always a part of what I was doing. And then things, it became more formalized for me as something I needed to devote work time to, really, I guess I would say after 9-11. Um, before that, it was something I was doing on a day-to-day -day basis, but more informally, because uh, until when 9-11 happened, I was actually uh, on the faculty at Berlin College teaching communication and teaching government and nonprofit management. But once 9-11 happened, I had to think to myself, like, how do I use this, this expertise or academic background in communication to really help Muslim communities, you know, um, be a bridge between Muslim communities and the larger universe because there was so much backlash and misunderstanding. And um, I ended up actually not getting tenure, which was disappointment, but a blessing, right? Because it also then led me work at the Interfaith Center, um, where I had a chance to really spend a lot of time thinking about the issues of, you know, of Muslim communities in New York and across the country, and how we could really um, contribute. I guess the goal is, for me is to, to be a bridge builder such that, you know, Muslim communities become a vibrant part of the city and the country. Um, not not simply tolerated, but appreciated, and that they're able to appreciate what they're bringing to the conversation, what we call American democracy, right? I think Muslims have a lot to offer this conversation based on our ethics and theology, um, and we are not at a moment right now where I think we're able to fully thrive and offer whatever I think is beautiful about our ethics and faith to the larger conversation because right now the Muslim community and the Muslim identity is an embattled identity, right? It's an identity that's seeking to survive and hasn't gotten to the point of thriving yet. And I feel like that's part of what I've been working towards and hope to contribute to. I don't know. I'll see it in my lifetime. Um, because questions of identity and community resiliency, these are very complicated <coughs> issues and um, the Muslim community, as we know, is a very diverse community, right? So how do you create unity within that diversity? It's a very complex question. All the questions that we have been struggling with in this country, race, class, gender, um, 
religious diversity, those are all questions that are within the Muslim umbrella as well, right? Because of the cultural diversity of, of the community. So there's a lot to work on, and it's, um, it's a very, you know, very rich um, environment to be in and thinking about and trying to work, work out. Deferring to the sisters, it's also no one ever wants to go first. Oh, that's my way. Oh, he's such a gentleman. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just want to say I'm honored to be with all three of you because when I first started um, my interface work, it was the Interface Center in New York and Sarah, and I met you mom, so it's, it's really nice to be back here. Um, what I do is I currently live in an intentional multi faith community where Muslim Jews and Christians live together. And I've grown up in a multi-faith country. And I think the reason why it's so important, and I'm so thankful for you as educators uh, to be here, is because most of the multi-faith, some of the best multi-faith conversations start at fourth grade lunch tables. <laughs> or fifth grade lunch tables. And I, you know, that is probably where the first, very first interfaith dialogue happens and the friendships really, really begin. And we tend to forget that. And also, a quote from Ibu Patel in one of his books says that almost any any time a baby is born in this country, it is a product of interfaith cooperation. It could be a Muslim doctor and a Hindu astrologist, you know, it would be a Catholic nurse in a Methodist hospital and a Jewish insurance agent. So everything you know, is a product of interfaith cooperation. And what I have learned over the years with regards to <laughs> interfaith work um, is that all of our all of our religious traditions are really based, our scriptures are based on roadmaps to justice and to peacemaking. And in our tradition, and I want to scare you, we use this word that I love and I want to reclaim, uh, the word jihad. Um, there's, you know, and there's two, kinds, there's two kinds of words. Like, there's the internal jihad, which is fighting for peace and imbalance within yourself. Like fighting for, you know, just the, the, attaining that, that sense of, of well-being. You know, and calmness, and, and just being able to to balance all of the things within yourself. And the out, the outer jihad, which is actually the lesser jihad, the greater jihad is inside. The lesser jihad is an outward struggle for righteousness and justice and equality and feeding the hungry, the hungry and and housing the homeless and fighting for for equality and balance outside. But until we figure out this first. We really can't even begin to think about even trying to do this in a correct way. And when you do interfaith work, it does not do any good if you are working with somebody else on a project who does not have his internal jihad figured out. Because only then can you all cooperate to do good works. And one of my favorite verses from the Quran is cooperate with one another in justice and righteousness. And so, so when I do interfaith work, I, I'm looking to my other faith partners to, to help me become the best Muslim I can be. And I hope that I can help them become the deepest in their faith by showing each other things from my tradition that maybe they forgot. And I have learned so much from their traditions by how they act and think and interpret that remind me about my tradition and show me the beauty in my tradition. And ultimately, the, what I always say, and this came to me a couple weeks ago when I was walking the labyrinth. Um, how many of you have ever seen a labyrinth or are familiar with them? They're, they're actually a pagan, um, pagan tool for reflection. The labyrinth has a center. And, you know, everybody, everybody takes their own journey to the center. Um, we all try to reach some sort of, heaven, whether you call it heaven or nirvana or, gosh, um, paradise. You know, the, the pagans call it summerland, enlightenment. We all try to attain that. But in a labyrinth, we're all taking an individual journey. Um, but some people go this way, some people jump right in the middle, some people go faster, some people take detours. But the important thing in life is that you just let everybody do their journey. And you let them do it, you know, you're respectful, and you just let them go on a path. And you help them, or they help you if you need it, but you just let them do their thing. And that's a very holy, holy concept in all traditions. Mm -hmm. And in the Quran it says, you shall have your religion, I shall have mine. Those are God's words, not mine. You know, so it is really a responsibility for me to, to dignify and honor everybody's tradition. 
And what I have noticed is that when the people next to you of different traditions help you in working for a cause, your numbers increase exponentially when it comes to lobbying, your efforts become astronomical, your voice becomes amplified, your financial resources become just quadruple, triple, <coughs> your manpower increases. Inshallah, <laughs> yeah. You can start speaking each other's languages. Baruch Hashem, praise God, alhamdulillah. <laughs> you know, and then, and then another thing happens is that you really start to see the word intersectionality, which has become such a buzzword. But really, I realize that it's when overlaying, when layers of oppression start to overlap. And just by showing up at different, different causes has really helped in areas that I have never, ever foreseen might ever help before. You know, I'm a, I'm a small that grew up in Fort Lauderdale, you know, in Catholic school, and I never, I never thought that one day somebody would come to me and say, how does it feel to be a person of color? And I said, oh. <laughs> well, you know, you didn't say that when I was line dancing with you in the honky tongs in college, but okay, let me think of that right now. <laughs> I just thought about that and I reflected, and you know, <laughs> I mean, it's an interesting question because in, in my lifetime, especially in the last five years, I have lost a lot of my white privilege. You know, I take my hijab on and off, and I'm a regular. You know, I mean, my whole identity can change, and my whole uh, perception by some people can change. Um, so when I first went to, to, to Ferguson, I started to realize that, that systematic racism is, and mass incarceration is, is very parallel to refugee camps, you know, and Islamophobia and, um, and black bodies and, and, and the movement for Black Lives Matter goes hand in hand. You know, that if somebody pulls you over and you are a person of color, you, 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 get, you, know, you get penalized, you know, so, so to speak. If they find out you're Muslim, you get double penalized. If they find out you're Latino, Muslim, and a person of color, and then if they find out you're LGBTQ, Muslim, Latino, and a person of color, you might as well just whatever to yourself. You know, so all of these things are just so intertwined. And then I went to, when I went to Standing Rock, there was a call by Chief Arvel Looking Horse. Um, he did a clergy call back in November. So we all went, you know, I ended up pitching a ride with some Unitarians and we all just <laughs> ended up there. And when I was there, I, was, I had never been to a, refu to a reservation before, ever. I don't know how many of you ever have, but for me, um, I mean, it looked like 1940s Southern Europe, like where my relatives had grown up. I mean, 1940s, from the pictures I had seen. You know, the, and it looked very hauntingly similar to the conditions of refugee camps in Greece. And this was this was American citizens who had been colonized, um, and there were drones made overseas by military aid money that we were getting the leftovers, not even the new stuff that were surrounding us. You know, in secondhand drones and secondhand SWAT gear. You know, and, and kids that had there was not even a fire department within 40 miles. I asked some of the elders there, I said, what do you do? They're like, well, we just fight them off with sheets. And that's what I used to read in the Little House on the Prairie books, mm -hmm. you know? And I was sitting there, um, you know, and I had, I had participated in a lot of interfaith rituals, but I had never really understood the chanting and the calling and the, the, the large circles, you know, I had, I had appreciated it. But when I was, when I was sitting, standing there next to an indigenous elder from Maori, because there were about 400 faith leaders that came out. And he said, where, where are you from? And I said, oh, there were about three Muslims there. And he, he said, where are you from? I said, oh, I come from uh, Iraq. He said, which part of Iraq? He said, I come from Najab. He said, do you know, you're, he goes, you're a Marshara. I said, yes, because you're from the oldest indigenous tribe in the world. And then all of a sudden, it was like, come to Jesus moment. <laughs> And then all of a sudden, everything just clicked, you know. And then I was called to, to speak, you know. And and then all of a sudden, I just remembered everything. I, you know, I realized when I spoke, I, I remembered how that when 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 the Shia were persecuted in Iraq, <coughs> how Saddam had diverted the Tigris to had damned the Euphrates to to you know to divert the Tigris to drown out the Marsh Arabs, and how when the the forces came into Iraq, they put pipelines under the rivers where Babylon was, where the Garden of Eden was, and how it's only 40 miles away from Babylon, you know, and 
And all of this, the same situation was again replicated right there. And I could see it. I could totally see it. And at that moment, when it was me and the pagan witch and the druid and the nun and, and the shintu and everybody standing there with this, these drones above us, it totally clicked on why we were all doing this together. And about two and a half months later, I was in D.C. and the band, the band was first happening. And I, there was there was a Native American, uh, there was a Native American parade, and there was also a migrant farmer justice parade two two days after. And we had done some work with the immigrant farm, tomato farm workers, um, called Immokalee farm workers in Florida, who are facing a lot of a lot of problems and have been organized as well. So when I first when we first heard about the band, I ran into one of the leaders. His name is Dallas Goldtooth. He he works with the Indigenous Environmental Network. And I said, Dallas, I'm really sorry there's not a big turnout here, but but um, we're really busy with the band. And he says, No band on stolen land. And I found that there was a shortage of people at that at that parade, and there was a shortage of people two days later at the migrant farmers or migrant farmers parade. Why? Because some of the Muslims had shown up at their air, their events, and they were all shutting down airports for me because I was too numb to do it. <laughs> and I believe 30 rabbis got arrested here. Mm -hmm. You know, even LGBTQ people in Dallas were shutting down airports. So the drag queens in the South were shutting down airports, <laughs> and everybody was like, "Huh?" <laughs> and they really did me a favor. I, I was too numb to even go to an airport. I mean, I was just literally paralyzed. And that was, that was just the beauty for me of, of intersectional work and of solidarity efforts and of really the spirit of interfaith cooperation and the potential of how things can mobilize instantaneously. Um, you know, whether it's a child being bullied that is an African American or a hijabi or a refugee or a gender fluid kid, it is absolutely an identical pattern in the systems that, that maintain refugee camps for 30 years, or you know, prisons, or Indian reservations. Those are identical systems that maintain. And those are all things that our scriptures tell us to stand up against. Um, and those are the things that have really, really alerted me and I have worked with. Um, and I, I definitely see those fruits, those stories, um, happening at the earlier, earlier levels. If kids are aware of it, you know, and if they're enlightened to it. Um, so those are the things that I work with. Alhamdulillah, Rabbi Rabbi. It's an honor and pleasure to be here again with you. Last year I was here. This is a beautiful experience for me. Somebody like myself coming to U.S. for a degree in communication and they are in the mass somewhere, they are in position of the imam. That's how the system of Allah works. So Alhamdulillah, I came here because I studied Arabic and Islam back home in my country. I will go. Because my grandfather was a sheikh. He taught my father, and my father passed all the knowledge to me. And uh, <coughs> 15 years uh, I taught Arabic, language and this Islamic culture, back home to some of the kids. 15 years of experience in teaching. Then left and went to Cairo. At, and I studied at you know, Al Azhar University. Then from Cairo went to Saudi Arabia, where I changed my major from Islamic culture to communication. Why? Because what do you learn? Know, Religion is based on communication. Interface law is based on communication. If I'm sitting with a rabbi or a pastor, I'm not pushing him to leave or quit his religion to follow the law. We must go together because we are human beings. 
So therefore, communication has helped me when we come to that. So I came here because one of my uh, my bosses encouraged me to come and get a degree here. Because he told me that he could not if you go to America and uh, study their communication. It would be so helpful. Because my mind <coughs> is that when I finish, I will go back to my country and so you have planned, <laughs> Allah has a plan for you. <laughs> no matter what you do, but it's the plan of Allah, it's the best of the plan. So there we are. I came and uh, we didn't have any mass here in this area. Not in the mass. We used to go to Malcolm Shabazz mass. When Imam Ali Rashid used to lead the prayer there, and he was a very nice to our community. But there was one problem, which is a language barrier. Because when you go to Imam and give Kutuba in the English, and people scream and go ahead, Imam, preach, and we see the man like this. We don't know what he's talking about. Finally, we come up with the idea to establish, to open our own place of worship because of language. Diversity in New York is so helpful. Even in my country, there is uh, 80 something tribes. There is 80 something tribes. What about New York? So many people, so many diverse people, communities. But it's good for us to come together and work together as well. So now we open Masjid Salah, Masjid Aqsa, by the grace of Allah. But today in Haram, we have almost 10 to 12 African mass by the grace of Allah. So, <clears throat> because of the system and because of the language, our people are afraid to come out for some reason. Why? Like I said, the lunch. And also, they don't know how to deal with system, the system of discrimination. That's one of the reasons we established the Council of African Imams. Throughout the council, we can help our people to integrate the system here, to get involved, engage themselves when we come to civic engagement. But it's still, the way is long, but inshallah, we we'll get in there. Remember, we are so grateful to have our system, Dr. Sarah said in my office. Because anytime something happens, we work with her office. We do workshops. You know about immigration. Know your right. Not only that, how to engage yourself civically. Because we're about to know for sure. Paper or no paper, we can do it anyway. Mm -hmm. We are part of the United States. We are part of New York. We can do it anyway. We establish a family here. How my daughter here and my son, where are we going? There is a saying which, in which they say, if you think you're going back home, listen to your children when they talk. Then I said, it means that you're not going anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> so you don't have no choice. You don't have no choice. So even because of immigration status, because of the fear to come out and provide people with their or you know, addresses. They don't go to the hospital. They go to a hospital when it's late. Everything is finished. They go to the hospital a couple of days, couple of months, they pass away. To my car, you have to walk with them. We met with the Harlem Hospital. Meeting after meetings, we established two clinics here in Ireland, which we call Medina Clinic. Based on 
Madinah al Munawwah. To get them confident that you know what, when you come to Madinah clinic, whatever information they're giving, know when they will share it with the other uh, offices or other, uh, how you call it. Uh. So the problem, we opened Madinah clinic. So what happened? Before they pick you, because they, they just give you a blue card. When you come for a visit, you pay $20. In the very beginning, it was at $15. You just pay $15 to check you out. With everything. So if you need medicine, you pay an extra $5. That's all. Because of that, many of our people used to live with HIV AIDS, but they didn't know. They don't know about it. Because of money in the they discovered that. Whatever they before they take care of you, they will check your blood, your HIV status to see if you have it or not. We found many of them living with the with HIV. And there was a big problem. The address they gave to Madina Clinic, some of these addresses was fake. And they live with HIV and they don't know. How can I get them? How can we reach out to them? Two out of the houses of worship. We call them to come back. And then, Alhamdulillah, today everything is fine. That's one of the reasons because of the success of Madiba Clinic. Brought in Lebanon Hospital, open is also open a clinic which we call Diaspora Clinic. But even though, because of the success of Manila Clinic, people coming from Bronx and Brooklyn, even New Jersey, to come and get treated, treated in Manila Clinic. Because the services are very higher and are very, they treat you because it's a base on cultural uh, sensitivity. Because the people who work for Manila Clinic, they mostly speak our language. French is our word of Fulani or Matinko. So you feel comfortable when you go. And if you are female, you want to be treated by a female doctor, no problem. If you are male, you want to be treated by a male doctor, no problem. So when we come to Dr. Face work, I'm very involved with it. Because I remember going and you know, doing 20 into a machine there one of the synagogues here, or the Riverside Drive, 70, 90-something, 90-second. I gave a speech to the synagogue, showing them that we are creation of Allah. What we fighting for? Let us live in peace and harmony and blessing one another. She mentioned, I'm not telling you to leave your religion. No. No. Let us see. There is a difference, but it's a little small. You can see and compromise. So that's one of the reasons I was at UPF, Universal Peace Federation, chose me as ambassador for peace. And the day I gave us speech at you, and this is what I mentioned to them. So you sitting here talking about peace around the world, but without clergy people, religious leaders, you're not making it. You know why? Because we talk to people every day. In case of calamity, we are there. Happiness, we are with them every single day. Their houses, and their house of worship, they trust us, they believe. You know, whatever happened, they will go first to their leader, spiritual leader, or imam, or chef, this is what happened. Please advise me. So they trust us, they believe in us. So you, and you don't have no choice, you have to work with us. If you don't, you're not making it. You are making it difficult, difficult for people to live in the country. The solution is not at all. If you don't accept this, we will not work with him. Nobody. Don't, don't do this. It's not. It's not. So 
that their face work. For me, it is a beneficial one. Even Prophet Muhammad Ali Sarat was Muhammad was living with Jews and Christians in Medina. When you look at the son of the Prophet, right? the Christian in the very beginning of Islam, they have Muslims because of Prophet Sarah and his companions to Abyssinia, Ethiopia today. And the king, it was a Christian king who said to Muslims, welcome to our country. You are free to leave as long as you want. Nobody will give you a hard time. So that their first walk is a very, very important thing. So that some of the people don't see even in the African community today, some of the people they are talking about imams of who you know who's dealing with you know who's a, who's a involved in the interface that you aspire, <laughs> you must be killed <coughs> because you're dealing with Jews, you're dealing with the Christian and they all are the enemies of Islam. They're not enemies. Allah called the Jews and the Christian in the Quran the people of the book, people of the scripture. Not only that, Allah says it's impermissible from today for you Muslims to marry the Christian sister or Jewish sister. So what is that? What is that? It means that we are in this together. And I was shocked and surprised. When I was invited this year, last past Ramadan, to breakfast in the house of residence of the ambassador of Israel. They sent me the first time in the history here in New York. And I was among the people who were invited. Result of Hendricks work. New York is a city. We are glad and happy. And we are so grateful to have this name here as our man. And we must help him by helping each other, talking to each other, talking about our differences. So in closing, even Imam Talib and I, we sat down and discussed our differences because it's not only African-African, but African-Americans. In Holland, interaction between Africans and African-Americans was so difficult because of the language barrier itself. Imam Talib and I, we came out with an idea to establish an organization which we call Harlem Islam Leadership. Harlem Shura, including every mosque in Harlem area, Africans, African Americans. And we sit down once a month to discuss about our differences so that we can work together. It's not only between Jews and Muslims and Christians and Muslims, Muslims ourselves. Shia, Sunni, Tijani, Muhammad. We all say that in the Muhammad Rasulullah. So what we find for When we come to Jihad, they misinterpret the Quran. She said it. One of the members, yeah, yeah, I'm going to stay another minute or so, but, <laughs> but okay. Thank you very much. I'm sorry, I really did not mean to interrupt that, right. that quickly. <laughs> uh, but we have about uh, 20, 25 minutes. So just, I'm not even going to, no preamble for me. Just throw this open for you guys. Yeah, Sarah. Okay, so I hear, like, I sit here and it's so beautiful, but I'm also curious to hear kind of the the darker and more negative experiences that you've had in your work. Um, so for example, like, are there parts of your tradition that, or, or verses from the Quran that you struggle with and that you have to kind of reconcile with your, I don't know, with, with other parts of your identity or um, Sarah, um, like your experience in politics. Like I can think of a number of as a New Yorker, I can think of, you know, just controversies and difficulties um, that have been coming up in the last few months. And I'm curious to hear some of those, 
experiences that you've had which have not been so positive and some of your fears and anxieties? Um, well, I mean, every day is like that, right? <laughs> I, the things that I spoke about, the work that I'm doing is really a response to that. I mean, we all have, we are in a climate of fear. This is a moment of great fear for, you know, for a lot of people in our country. And it's been that way for a long time now. But I think that for me, as somebody who is working in politics, I can't be fear of it in my decision. I have to really work to counter that, and that's part of why I think I'm there to help people, you know, understand that very thing. Like we have to make policy decisions that are not fear grounded, right? Um, as far as things struggling with things in my own faith, I mean that's also that's also a struggle, right? Um, because I think for a long time, like Imam Konate was talking about that well, there are people who don't understand the value of interfaith engagement, there are people who don't understand the value of civic engagement, there are people who are within the Muslim community who are very afraid of government, they're afraid of the police department, um, and there are people who are in our larger city who don't like government, right? There, there's a lot of mistrust and distrust and cynicism and despair about the state of leadership and government in the city and the country and in the world. Like, what do our leaders really have to offer us? And so here I am, at, I am in this moment where there is all of that, and I find myself in politics. Like, how do I deal with this whole, you know? It's, it's very hard. Um, and the only thing, like Imam Kanati was saying, I just feel like continuing to build communication, putting people in the same room is really important. I mean, contact is the single most um, important factor in disrupting prejudice and misunderstanding, right? And we all know that contact theory is, you know, basically having people interact, having people meet, even the idea of meeting can help disrupt bias and discrimination, help build better community. Um, so part of what I'm really trying to do is educate Muslims on the value of civic engagement. Before that, I was trying to educate Muslims on the value of interfaith. Um, and finding things that affirm that in our own faith. Um, and there's, there's a lot. Um, and I think, I, I guess I just, I think it's really important for, for, uh, for all of us to try to uplift the positive in our traditions and um, the other area I didn't really talk about, but which I spent a bunch of work, time working on, not so much, it's not related to the job, but with women in Islam, we spent a lot of time thinking about women's inclusion in the mosque. <coughs> and there are, you know, people have theological understandings that try to limit women's inclusion, whether it's in the mosque or a public square. Um, and so part of what we have to do is like, we expand the ways that people are thinking and use, again, theology and different understandings of theology, um, which are all there, you know, and all grounded in the tradition that we just have to kind of highlight. I should say, Sarah, they have uh, the report that you co-authored is an optional reading in their uh, reader for, for Monday, when we will talk a little more about gender issues um, in, in the mosque and so um, Sarah, you wanted to pick up on this one? Yes, yes. Well, you know, we have to remember that all religious scripture is really based on applying the scripture to today's context and time and situation. So it's all basically jurisprudence, and it's very malleable. Um, you know, just like the Constitution or just like any legal document, um, you have to take it to the time, you have to think about it from the time that it was revealed or written down, and you have to really try to apply it to today's context. And there's so many different interpretations. And part of Islamic thought is that we are allowed to each have our own moral autonomy on how we, how we use it um, to benefit others, so long as it doesn't harm others. And that's where the problem is in any faith tradition. And I think um, we're not necessarily, we are reminding people of the goodness in, in faith. And I think that's a problem 
that the country is facing as a whole is that spirituality, although it's on a rise, but religion is really on a decline as far as the respect for religion and its potential for good. Because the more, from what I've noticed, the more that people are really grounded in their scripture, the more feminist they are, the more liberal they are, the more open-minded they are, the more willing to engage and think and ration and, and, and dialogue. That's what Bible study is. That's what talking Torah is. That's what Islamic thought is about. Um, so there's been a movement away from that, and there's actually been kind of, a, a, you know, a demeaning of it. You know, when you see television on the channel, it's usually at 2 a.m. in between infomercials, or they think we chant and high five God all day, but they don't know that we're really problem solvers. You know, and that is what seminary is. I'm assuming. I mean, it seems it seems very hard. <laughs> I've never done it, but I you know it seems very very difficult. So it's about it's a matter of reminding people what theology really is and the potential for the people of, and religious leaders and communities to do good as far as civic engagement. Because there are a lot of people that will tell you religion is politics, and civic engagement is synonymous with politics. You know, Quakers will tell you Quaker, some Quakers I have met that say, said that Quaker and, and peacemaking are synonymous terms. Uh, so it really just depends on the context. And some people, I mean, I feel that Islam is the reason why I'm a feminist. You know, somebody else will, will tell me to my face, well, you're oppressed. You know, and I'll say, well, that, that's your interpretation. You know, I, I like wearing long sleeves. If you, you know, I, I think you're oppressed if you have to wear a bikini in front of a magazine, on a magazine cover. I mean, so it just all depends on perception. Um, and that's what we have to realize. It's everybody's context. Um, I think something both of you have touched on that um, I would like to speak more about if possible is how to support people when they do have this hopelessness. And I, I don't want to say nihilistic, because I feel like that, I don't know, I feel like there should be a better word for it. But when, <coughs> when you're trying to bring people in contact with each other and they're so hurt, that that's just not even an option. Um, how do you maneuver that? What, what coping skills might you suggest for me as an educator, um, for myself and for my students, um, to, to help bring healing into my classroom? Sarah, I think you put this so wonderfully before when you're saying that you, know, you feel like right now American Muslim communities are in such a difficult moment and so traumatized in some ways that it's like hard to offer their best to American civic life. I think that's kind of what like how do you get people to that place where they can offer their best? Yes. And what can what, what can teachers do? It, well, at the center, you know, we actually have developed this interesting approach over the years. The Interface Center, one of the things that it does is really try to create common ground between people who are living in a shared geography. Um, and often that doesn't require people to talk about the things that they're conflicted about. Um, so if there are religious differences, if there are interfaith conflicts, which there are in the world, people can still come together and think about what are the problems we face in common living in this community? How do we work on those together, right? So the contact is happening around shared goals and a shared vision for the community that we all live in. So, um, and that doesn't have to be about the treatment that your community is experiencing. Um, so we at the, when we were at the, at the Interfaith Center, we created like a conference format where people just came together and talked about like housing or immigration or you know other things that weren't about like why are our why is my faith community being treated this way by your faith community? Do you know what I mean? That's, but that's also really important to talk about, right? There are moments in which the conflict is heated and you have to do something to allay the emotional charge around it. And um, I think giving young people um, conflict resolution skills is really, really important. Building that from a very young age, building listening skills is really important. A lot of times in the classroom from a young age, we learn how to present our arguments, and present our speeches, and we learn how to talk, right? We are not given instruction on how to listen. And we, we're, we're also not taught about 
why conflict is important and how you can master it and how you can still work with other people, right? So I feel like that's something we really, really, both of those things are really important for educators to be doing more of. Um, yeah, I hope that helps. Yes? Thank you, no, no, but I think actually the, the, the um, active listening with empathy is very, very important, especially with kids, even as young as first grade, <coughs> where they dignify everybody else's stories and validate everybody else's feelings and experiences, um, because that is the most important thing. And, and probably alert people that, that the realities that they feel are the causes of their problems are not necessarily the causes of their problems. Right now in this country, there are a couple of default words that you can go to a community and they'll have automatic answers. Um, everything, you can talk to about flood in Mississippi, oh, ISIS, you know. You can say um, another thing, oh, oh terrorists, okay, let's well, focus, you know. <laughs> you know, so there are a couple of default answers that have become buzzwords for the blame on everything. But I think by just really getting to the heart of the problem through that active listening, they'll find out that not everything is associated with what they hear on television. And that these, these marginalized communities are not the root causes of every problem in the states. And only through shared stories about common differences and common um, problems, the problem really be able to pass it. Maybe, as, um, as briefly as possible. Sure, on that note, as far as like, then how do you combat this kind of, you know, the power of repetition? Because I get that, um, you know, it's extremely important for people to like look at the contextual approach, you know, to understand all these religions and but because we're being bombarded on the daily with these kind of with these narratives that put that continue to pit us against each other how do you i mean i think there's every day there's like a you can take a new story and make it a teachable moment right i mean there there are ways to take whatever the story is and bring a person, another person into the classroom who has, can offer a different perspective on whatever the story is about, right? So even if it's like a protest of, you know, I don't know, a Black Lives Matter protest, you could bring in a Black Lives Matter, you know, advocate to speak to students, right? So similarly, if it's a story about, if it, there's a um, television like news clip about Muslims, a Muslim person into the classroom to share their perspective. And I think just the I, the ability or the, the offering of different perspectives is helpful to students in terms of their critical thinking. Um, and I feel like that's that's part of what's really missing is like we just kind of are bombarded, like you're saying, with things, and we're, we don't even have the time to really think about what we're hearing and, and listening. And I think the classroom that's something I don't know to what extent um, that happens as far as critical thinking about media you know, I, don't, I don't know media portrayals overall I'm not sure how much that happens in the classroom a little bit yeah. we have time for a couple more questions I know I wanted to I'm sorry I wanted to see if any of our summer scholars have other things so I like it. Um, I'm wondering about I, I, I was touched by a lot of things that you guys said but I think particularly how your vision about people coming together and, 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 and sort of doing work for these incredibly important issues that are out there um, so I see the organizations that you work with um, should the local teachers be aware of other organizations that are enabling people to come together in particularly powerful ways, and especially that would enable our students to come together with kids? Remember, oh, yes. yeah. so, Elijah, among other things, is, uh, helps to do um, service learning at an independent school in Brooklyn, and yeah. is eager to have great places for the students to serve. No, no, that's the best. That's really the best way is getting kids projects together with diverse groups of kids because nothing fosters their, their leadership skills. Once you see them together and they don't realize how different they are, that when you put them together on a project, um, you will see them just come together because of their shared values. So for example, if you get a group of, from different traditions like Muslim, Jewish, and Christian kids, 
and they'll come together in a little project. Um, the Muslim kid, or the Jewish kid, will go back to his mom and say, "Mom, what does Tikkun and Olim mean again?" <laughs> you know, or what? You know, they'll come back and they'll really want to find out why they're so grounded in doing good work. And the friendships will form. They'll grow up together, but they'll show each other their faith traditions, you know, insidiously. And then you'll see who the leader is. He'll show up. You'll see who the creative person is. Who maybe you want to create a flyer. But that is by far the best work that they can do to engage is through a project together. And that's even the template for um, Interfaith Youth Corps. So that definitely is the best way. Get diverse communities together, put them together, and just turn them loose on projects. <laughs> I have one. It's like what something Sarah said. But, uh, it kind of inspired me when you were talking about focusing and on positive things. What if, I, and this is just, I'm asking you, would you think about this idea as what a classroom? You can tell I teach in the South and in, in, in Tennessee is where I'm at. I, I'm having a hard time for my kids focusing on the positive. We like are so entrenched in negativity. Uh, what if? I turned it around and said, I want you to focus on just yourself and, and let's just point out all the negative things that you you do and see <laughs> what happens. Like, all the negative stuff that you go through on a weekly basis, all the bad things that you've done, let's put that out there on a billboard and let's look at it. <laughs> and let's see what happens. Now let's flip it around and take the positive things you see what I'm saying? Like I'm trying to change the culture in my area to one that's not toxic and negative to a positive thing. But I'm, I'm working with middle schoolers, so they, they're all about themselves. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think that would be a good idea for us? Because we have, we have a decent uh, Muslim population that's moving into the area, you know, and predominantly Protestant, but do you think that would be a good idea? Can I add like a kind of uh, another point to that? Because I've been thinking about this quite a bit in this conversation. And I, I feel like from a from a from a civic community building perspective, and especially for s the study of Islam and Muslim communities, given the backdrop of Islamophobia, mm -hmm. um, it's so important to accentuate the positive. Yeah. But then from a from a more mm -hmm. academic, you know, more rigorous scholarly perspective, I think there's a real danger in teaching about religious diversity in a way that just kind of like uh, it, it highlights like all the nice things in every faith tradition. Every faith tradition, Islam and every other, has like a complicated mix of wonderful, you know, ethical values that can inspire us and really kind of more, more troubling stuff. Um, so I wonder I mean, how you balance those. On that because I think we get so much negative about so religion. Much. We are bombarded. Not just Islam. Not just, just Islam, it's just religion overall. So like we have Americans have no understanding of what constructive role religion can play in people's lives, right? It's constantly a source of negative and conflict. Whether that's about abortion or war. You know, it, it's just like a, religion is a problem, and it's I feel constant. like we need to deproblematize religion mm -hmm. by teaching about what is positive about it. Like, why does it inspire people's lives, right. right? And that's the thing you can ask your students if they come from a faith background or no faith background. What are the values that inspire your family? <coughs> where do those come from? You know, and to get that conversation happening in the classroom because that makes them self-critical and self-reflective. Um, and I'm not sure about the particular exercise you mentioned. I mean, I think it's really important to build the listening skills, build empathy skills. Um, I'm forgetting the name of the group, but um, Islamic Networks Group partnered with another organization to develop a curriculum that helps kids think about difference and in a way that really emphasizes a shared humanity. Um, but you can approach difference, not just from rel a religious standpoint, but you can talk about difference in terms of religion, in terms of I mean, gender, you can talk about race, you can talk about ability, right? Just, I don't know, family size, family composition. There are 
many inroads into exploring what difference is about. Um, and even if you have like no religion, no racial or ethnic diversity in your classroom, you can still explore the topic of difference in you know a variety of ways. So I think that's what we need. The last word, and then we have to re stop in a couple minutes. Oh, no, I just say, I, I think it, all of this depends on the context because and I, I, I see where Henry's coming from. Because the reality is that, uh, just like our last speaker, religion is embedded, there's an entanglement of politics and culture. So you talked about Native American experience, right? I, I work in a community where you still have missionaries. I work in a community where there's a Mormon community that's damned the water that keeps people from practicing their religion in their community. Mm -hmm. Now, the reality is, you know, we can come together, like, all right, accentuate the positives, right? But it won't, it, the rea it'll be more if there's this idea of a negative piece versus a positive piece. I personally think that it's not so much about stressing the positive, but about being authentic with each other. And, and sometimes there aren't easy answers. What we could do is we could build community, might better try to build community, and maybe foster mutual understanding, but these things are extremely political sometimes, especially for Native communities. I mean, and it's not only Native communities. I mean, uh, and that's how I see it, because it's not as simple as just stressing the positive, especially when there's a, there's, there's, there's real implications, right, in people's lives. I, I'd like to just clarify that I'm not talking about stressing the positive over the negative. Like, I don't think that, I don't want to approach my life from out of five We were talking about the news. Situation. Yeah, I mean, I think that the news and the sources of information that we have about religion are overwhelmingly negative. Mm -hmm. And my point is that in order for people to learn how to be critical thinkers, they need to be given alternative information that provides a holistic understanding of what religion means to people, what value it adds to people's lives. And that's not about highlighting the positive and like forgetting about all the negative. It's just about providing a whole picture of what, what this phenomenon means in people's lives. And, uh, and when I talk about being positive or having a po positive outlook, that for me is a very like a personal, <coughs> spiritual, psychological, impetus, right? Because I cannot allow, if I spend my life living by what I am told a Muslim is in the media and the world around me, I would be very depressed. <laughs> I would never go out anywhere. I would not be doing the job I'm doing, right? Like, I might have even committed suicide a long time ago. So, like, I feel, I feel like I would have to provide a holistic understanding of what faith means, whether it's in the classroom or in my work, just so that people, we can all coexist. I see my beatings. And that's... that's Good way to go. Sorry. <laughs>